Um, today, I will speak about the uh, development of uh, more sustainable and energy efficient buildings um, by means of um, you know, using cold foam steel structures. So different types of building materials, as we know, are being used in construction industry for quite some time. And the most popular ones are probably concrete and heavy steel. Um, we do have timber as well, but um, cold foam steel being a relatively new material has been only in construction industry for maybe around 20 to 30 years where the application of those of these type of steel members are more um, you know, getting popular every day. And, and, and there has been a lot of advantages of these cold foam steel materials as compared to other types of building materials, which I would cover in, in my uh, presentation. So to start with, what is cold rolled steel? So another name of cold foam steel is also cold rolled steel. So what is the definition? So um, the definition of light gauge steel or cold rolled steel or cold foam steel is, is that it is a thin metal that is manufactured by cold rolling process at room temperature. The name cold comes from room temperature as you get to see that some of the coils here. So we do have different coils. So we basically pass it on to a um, roll forming machine to roll forming at different um, at room temperature and shape it into different cross section, which can be used for different structural engineering applications. In terms of the, the coatings, which goes on top of these um, steel coils, so we have galvanized coatings, which are also good for um, corrosion protection and also good for extreme weather applications. If you are using or building or constructing your houses or your structures in area which is really, really close to coastal or really close to ocean, then you have to sort of um, use a material which can be corrosion protective. So cold foam steel has that advantage of, of being corrosion protective. Um, why cold? As I said, the room temperature uh, manufacturing process is in the room temperature, hence why the name is um, sort of um, 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 cold, cold foam steel. Now, going to the next slide. Um, so, so the differences between the hot roll steel and cold foam steel, as we know that hot roll steel is normally um, manufactured or produced at, at above 900 degrees Celsius, uh, where you, uh, you basically um, you know, uh, burn a lot of coals and, 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 and you use a lot of energy, which is the problem of recent time. But if you compare against cold foam steel, as you can see that cold foam steel is manufactured at, at room temperature, which is where you get to save a lot of energy and making, it, making the environment more sustainable. In terms of grading, you normally go up to 700 MPA for hot rolled steel, but for cold foam steel, we only go up, to, we can go up to 1000 MPA, which is higher sort of uh, strength of, of, the, of the steel. In terms of yielding strength, a lot of uh, structural engineers would be familiar with the term or um, initial strain, uh, which starts at an actual yield value um, in, in case of hot rolled steel, but in case of cold foam steel, due to the cold uh, working process or due to the roll forming process, the yielding strength actually increases up to 260% if you compare with the uh, hot rolled steel, where you basically are applying a lot of um, initial, um, you are reducing the initial uh, strain um, in case of um, hot and cold foam steel. In terms of ductility, if you are designing your structure, particularly uh, in, in seismic prone areas, for example, in New Zealand, where I come from, uh, it's a lot of, um, a lot of structures are, are, are designed for uh, ductile behavior because of the high seismicity and because of a lot of um, earthquakes um, which, which can happen and which has happened in the past. So ductility of cold foam steel is not as high um, as, as compared to um, you know, hot rolled steel. In terms of weight, which is probably the biggest advantage if you compare with hot rolled steel, as you can see that the weight of uh, cold foam steel is, is, is really, really light, which makes it so easy to, to, to work with. Uh, for example, if you were to install these cold foam steel members, then you wouldn't need a crane or you wouldn't need a gantry for your um, installation or for application uh, purposes. In terms of sex and geometries, you do have different types of standard safes for hot rolled steel, but um, uh, for cold foam steel, you can desire, you know, you can you can basically customize your safes based on your requirements. So that's quite flexible. So if you were to, for example, roll form or, or manufacture a particular type of cross section, you could design the rollers accordingly, and that will get you those different cross sections. In terms of dimensions and tolerance thicknesses, as you can see that for, cold, for hot roll steel, it's normally in between two millimeters to 25 millimeters, but for light gauge steel or for cold foam steel, it's about 
0.42 millimeters to 3.5 millimeters, you can have an extra bit of tolerances, about 0.1 millimeter, but normally it does not go beyond that um, maximum or upper bound. Um, in terms of energy and cost, which is what, where I want to focus more in today's um, lecture, uh, is that it, uh, for hot cold steel, it consumes a lot more energy during the manufacturing. Um, it costs almost twice the cost of cold foam steel members. So, um, and if you compare with cold foam steel, the energy consumption is really, really less. And hence why I'm making it more sustainable and environmental friendly. Um, in terms of the application, we get a wide range of applications, different structures. You can use it for bridges and buildings and for both hot rolled steel and cold foam steel. But cold foam steel is yet to be developed to be used for you know, multi-rise construction. It's only uh, for low to medium rise construction at the moment where high ductility is not needed. Um, because if you go for multi-rise, you would need high ductility and you have to design for seismic and earthquake. Um, and in that case, um, cold foam steel is probably not the um, only choice in that case, you have to make hybrid structure by combination of uh, cold foam and hot foam, or even other types of materials you can use. So some of these key differences between the two different materials, hot foam steel and cold foam steel. Um, now, the next slide will talk about um, the, the manufacturing process. So a little bit about manufacturing process. So as you get to see that these are the rollers. So these are used for rolling the cold foam steel coils into different um, you know, desired cross sections or whatever type of cross sections you may need. Um, so we do have two different options to manufacture. Either we go by rolling option, so which is by means of these rollers, or you can even press it. So if you have a flat coil and you use a pressing machine to press it to um, to give a cross section of your desired shape. Um, so normally it's widely used in different applications. It's used in buildings, bridges, automobile industry, roofing structures, um, and different types of other um, applications as you see on screen. Now, um, in the manufacturing process, as you have, have, um, I've, I've tried to show you more in, in focus of how these are manufactured, some of these, um, you know, um, simple configurations of how, what's the maximum typical length or maximum typical length of these sections are six meters. So not very uh, rapid manufacturing process as compared to roll forming process in case of press breaking. So in press breaking, you are not really going into that deep um, processes or, or extensive you know, roll forming process, hence why you're saving a lot of time as compared to uh, roll forming process. Um, examples, so what type of examples um, uh, or structures that you can, or profiles you can get of these cold form steel. So you can normally get channel sections, you can get angle sections, you can get strip sections, Z sections, and all other types of sections that you can uh, manufacture. Um, so the videos are there, which I, um, I can play to show you how these are, uh, you know, manufactured as you, as you see that, um, you know, this is this is a flat coil here, and you have a press. You have a press. So if you want a clip, sort of a clip, uh, for your for your uh, connections, then you can use a press machine. As you as you get to see that press machine, you can also use a press machine to uh, to 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 uh, press these uh, flat coils and to uh, and to uh, you know manufacture the decking profile or for you know any other types of roofing profile, for example. However, this press breaking is not that popular in industry. We normally use roll forming process and roll forming is, is quite easier and more flexible in terms of the amount of profile that you can get um, of, of these cold foam steel sections. Um, as I said, roll forming, you do have, so this is your flat, uh, sorry, it's going to the next slide. I'll come back to the previous one. So um, roll forming, as I said, you have the flat coil and you have these rollers. And with the, with the rollers, you have different ty types of rollers. So based on, let's say you need a channel section. So you need to use different combination of rollers uh, to start rolling it into the desired cross section until the point you get the actual uh, cross section that you need. This is another roll forming technology or, or process for roofing profiles that, um, that we use for roofing. Um, now, FrameCAD is, is a company in New Zealand. They do use a lot of um, cold foam steel uh, um, manufacturers. They are um, basically uh, the manufacturing company of roll, foam, roll forming machines, and they, they, they write the software and packages for those as well. So they have written a software called uh, FrameCAD uh, Structure. So um, that, that's, that's, that's what is, is used mostly in New Zealand to, um, to design. However, I would extensively talk about the design principles and what guidelines you need to meet as a structural designer for um, an environmental, um, how the environmental, um, you know, sustainability and energy efficiency concepts would be taken into account 
for uh, designing these cold foam steel members. I would cover those in some of my next slides um, as we go on. Now, NASH is sort of a design um, national association of steel housing that's operated in New Zealand, also in Australia. Um, similar, um, um, you know, um, research um, um, organizations uh, are, are also there in different parts of the world. And, and, and normally the basic guidelines are, the, uh, are very similar uh, and country specific. So um, basically the design guidelines which are uh, proposed are, are well documented and, and user-friendly NAS, which can be uh, utilized. Now, coming to different cross sections and structural profiles of cold foam steel, as you get to see that you do have different channel sections, so that can be used for, you know, beam members, column members, or any other types of members. You have Z profile that can be used for purlins, could be used for raptors, and any other types of applications in your structure. You do have toffet sections, which can again be used for battens, for purlins. You have then L types of profiles, which is angle sections or L profiles, which are used mostly in transmission towers, you would have seen. So a lot of these different cross sections could be easily manufactured using cold foam steel coils. And we can also have panels. So these are different types of panels as you get to see that you have floor decking, you have long span composite deck where you can fill in with concrete. You have different roofing panels and different profiles. You have different types of corrugated profiles as well, which are used for both wall cladding as well as for roofing. Um, the most convenient of um, the most convenient of, of all these profiles are, are, are these two um, channel section and Z section, which are the most popular ones, which are used in industry. Um, C section and, and Z section. So C section is sort of a um, you know um, channel section, which is a singly symmetric section, so which is only symmetrical about one axis, but not symmetrical about the other axis. However, for Z section, as you get to see that um, it's also a point symmetric um, sort of section. Uh, which is um, which is also used in uh, different structural applications. Now, um, cold foam steel structural applications. So now, up until here, we we talked about you know um, um, different uh, different profile options, and now coming to the actual application in cold foam um, in, in in the building design and in building construction. As you get to see that all of these example um, here, as you see on screen, these are all made of cold foam steel. Um, so these are mostly in sort to um, mid-rise buildings um, up to four stories to nine stories, which are common and supported in different building codes, um, including you know, Australia, New Zealand, also American standard, European standard, and different other standard of, of different countries. Um, so they're also used for both uh, wind control and seismic region. So if you are having an extra high wind zone or extra seismic um, region, then you should be able to use these cold foam steel members. Uh, normally, uh, this is sort of the unit weight of, of 16 kg per meter square of steel for single story building and, and roughly about 20 kg per meter square of steel for two story building. This much of uh, weight of the steel you would get um, per meter square of, of floor area um, if you were to use um, your uh, full form steel in your construction. Some of the typical detailing of how you know, these members are connected and how um, in a bracing of these members, for example, um, whether you should be using a K bracing system or you should be using um, any other types of bracing system. Uh, so those um, details are here on screen. I'm not going into uh, the details of the detailing part, but I'll rather focus more on the research side as we, as we go on. But uh, some of the details, if you are um, interested in, you can look back um, at the slides and, and, and probably get a bit more understanding of how the details are. This is also a framing wall. So as you see that these are the channel section, which I've talked about before. And so these are called stud members. So these studs are having some web perforations or web openings. So we do have the nogging. So these are your, these are working as the noggings. And, and so this is your, uh, you know, plasterboard or your jib board, um, whatever you do use for your um, wall panels. And so these, these are connected at different spacing. So you have to do all the structural research and analysis to understand what should be the spacing or center, center distance of these um, wall uh, stud member and then the tracking or the track or the plate members and also the noggin. Now coming to the research side, what uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, structural testing in terms of how these members actually perform. So if we were to use these members in different structural applications, we can use it for axial compression or we can use it for, you know, uh, um, for bending members, if you're using for columns, then compression is the biggest uh, problem um, because you can have different types of buckling. Because these members are quite thin members, so you tend to get a lot of buckling. Um, so that's why um, uh, different buckling modes are important. You have local buckling, distorsional buckling, you have global buckling. 
and all these buckling uh, scenarios to be to be tackled and designed properly so you then don't get those problems um, in your actual structure so uh, some of these testings we've been doing using um, and these are some of the results that we've received uh, from from testing those um, this is a typical system of, of a, a bracing system as you said as I was saying that you can have a k bracing or you can have a x uh, uh, you know strap bracing so all these bracings we were testing in the lab to understand their lateral load bearing capacity um, some of the testing that uh, these testings were done in um, before um, in in in, uh, in the US and states um, we are trying to replicate these testings as well so this is a Test being done, you say San Diego in 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 UC Berkeley, about a six six story building in a sake table to understand the the uh, the saking or, or, or the um, uh, the damages that that could occur in the, that building um, uh, in, in terms of um, you know the seismic uh, failure or the earthquake failure, and we also then um, um, studied using FEA or finite element simulations. We tried to understand the post earthquake fire performance. Using the the test results of this of this test, which was validated through our test, uh, quickly um, there is a time lapse video. Of, this is sort of the test as you see on screen. Um, about um, two ways uh, a test was done in 1994, um, but we've been trying to capture the same behavior using FPA and trying to understand a better design the different components and connection of this test. Um, now. Um, so in, 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 in case of different application in different countries, as you get to see, if you were to use like in 10 story or beyond three or four story buildings, you are not um, recommended to use only cold form steel. In that case, you have to use a combination of reinforced concrete or you can have um, cold form steel with hot rolled steel or any other types of um, heavy uh, you know, members, which can take a lot of loads because um, otherwise cold form steel members would buckle and fail in different buckling modes. Um, so this is another test which was done. So now coming into the, uh, the applications uh, part in different modular construction, which we can, we can use for different, um, you know, uh, full form steel members. So as you get to see that these are, uh, you know, houses being built in New Zealand quite uh, fast. And there was a, a project that we were doing a house in like three days to finish all these uh, projects within time. And as you see, that it's being such a lightweight material, so we sort of um, can lift it uh, on site, and you can um, place one module, the whole module, on top of the other. So these are sort of um, modular construction, you may you may call it, and 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 it's just so easy to assemble, prefabricate everything on manufacturing plant, and just install um, on site would be would be really really easy in that case. You don't have to do all the um, you know manual installation um, on site, saving a lot of time and energy, of course. Um, then the other types of application or structural applications of these cold form steel members are also in portal frames, which is in industrial buildings and uh, in different commercial buildings, as you get to see in warehouse and other types of industrial set buildings, you would see um, a lot of these, um, you know, uh, warehouse buildings are constructed. So you do have, again, the different applications um, would have the similar uh, members, uh, cold form steel channel sections. Sometimes you may have to make built up sections to make it even stronger to, um, you know, um, span it uh, wider and to take a lot of loads because for these, you probably would be talking about, sometimes you talk about 50 meters, 60 meters. In that case, you would need a lot of cold form steel members. So one of the easiest ways to do it is by making the sections composite uh, by using screws or, uh, or bolts or connections to make it built up by joining different uh, single channels into composite or, or cold form steel channels. Um, so this is um, another application. So we've been doing a lot of testing on seismic behavior and how the connections fail because uh, with these portal frames, I think um, uh, what we found out is the connections are the key, uh, you know, uh, design sort of um, uh, failure point. So we we had to test it under different configurations, under seismic loads and gravity loads. So we used um, two cases. One case we used only the framing, and in the other case we used the cladding as well. Because with the cladding, you sort of have a stress skin action, which is uh, by by use it by by supporting those framing as a lateral load bearing or load resisting members so without having to have those bracing system which i was showing you earlier you would be able to achieve um, some sort of um, lateral restraint by just simply using the cladding which we anyway will use it in normal uh, you know construction so we tested it with the bare cladding on and, and and we tested it without the cladding and then we tested with the cladding and compared the results uh, which we saw a lot of improvements in in terms of their lateral load bearing capacity so some of the other research that we've been doing here 
is in terms of wrecking pellet wrecking system. So these are all made of full foam steel as well. So um, one of the innovation and, and the findings of research that we did is to find out the base plate for the flow connection. So we tried to design a typical base plate, which can take maximum amount of load and also can take the seismic load, which is uh, very much important. Um, so we did a lot of safe table testing under both ways and X and Y direction. And some of the, um, some of the testing um, was done in Oakland U. Um, and as you can see that um, these are uh, some of the, um, you know, videos of, of testing that, um, you know, the frame uh, was built and the full scale frame was built. And then um, this is the seg table and then how this whole structure uh, actually failed, but it actually went up to um, the, the, uh, the minimum requirement of, of, the, of those um, base plates that, that was designed. Um, now coming to the design challenge, right? So we, we, talk, we, do, we do research, but in terms of, you know, um, the application of these uh, in, in the actual industry. So we did, um, so in, in, in reality, we do have two different types of methods. So we have effective width method and we have direct strain method. So both these two methods are really simple to use it for a designer. So, um, uh, you, so some, of the, uh, some of the design codes that um, we normally use is Australia, New Zealand standard, European standard, American standard. We do have Chinese standard, we do have Japanese standard and, and other countries standard as well, Indian standard. Some of the other countries also have developed standard, but the key, uh, the, 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 the most um, you know, um, popular ones which um, people use uh, is uh, these three standards here. And then we locally, we have um, NASH for design guidelines. So this slide here put together to show you how to, how to analyze these cold foam steel members. And um, for example, if we take a channel section we normally would um, uh, would um, have different methods, as I said, that we can have a finite strip method, we can have a finite element method, or we can have building information model. So in finite strip method, what we do, we divide the whole cross section, or we divide the whole geometry into small, uh, you know, strips or, or plates, and then we try to assess the structural performance or, or analyze the behavior of the plate by applying different loads um, based on compression, bending, or shear, or any other types of load that you want to design for. Um, and if we were to design a member, then we can use a thin wall tool, which is a software developed by University of Sydney, or you may want to use um, CUFSM, which is a software developed by John Hopkins University. If you were to use finite element method, which is mo the most popular around the world right now, and then in that case, you have to use um, for Abacus, ANSYS, or Lucis. These are the three main softwares that we use for analyzing, uh, you know, cold foam steel members under different loading conditions and design it accordingly. So, for um, uh, the difference between finite element and finite strip is just that in case of finite element, you're dividing the whole cross section and the geometry into small elements and not just doing it like a strip, what you do it in case of finite strip method. Um, then we have the third type, which is building information modeling. And in case of building information modeling, what we do is basically, it is a, a sort of a very user-friendly um, platform where we get to share information um, coming from different parties who are involved in the in the design part and also in the construction part. For example, if you are working in a structural um, uh, design company, then all your design uh, you know information um, would be shared in this common interface called a building information modeling interface, which would be shared by all the parties, not just yourself, but also construction officials, manufacturing of these members, cost and time estimations. All of these people would share their information. So in case if you had any changes in your design, you should be able to make those changes. So FrameCAD structure software, which I introduced earlier in my presentation is normally used for the structural design part. And then Autodesk Revit is normally used for, um, you know, designing and, and all the uh, architectural design. And then you can use either a Vertex software or you can use a, any other of these softwares to calculate all the structural engineering uh, behavior. Um, so this is sort of how do we analyze and how do we design um, these cold foam steel members if we have to use it in actual uh, practices. Um, some of the information, if you um, were to find out more information, this slide is basically to show you how do you get this information about um, installing the softwares in Thinwall and FrameCAD software and Abacus as well. Um, so uh, some of the other research that we've been doing in recent time is uh, full scale, um, you know, I start joint testing, for example, we developed this um, type of profile with a company uh, called Howick New Zealand. And, and, and so this is how it looks like. So, so this is sort of a having web perforations, making the web really susceptible to different types of failure, including web crippling or 
local buckling failure or even sear failure can happen due to having these perforations. But these perforations are also very important for building design because of installation of services, for example, electrical or plumbing services, you would need these holes for electrical wires or any other um, um, uh, um, applications of these, uh, you know, plumbing services that if you need to design for. Um, so there's a speed flow system, which having, um, you know, typical type of as different holes. Um, so we've been doing a lot of research on, on, on how these holes can be uh, stiffened um, with having sort of age different holes, which can actually increase the capacity by a lot. So we did um, design that, um, uh, that those, those channels and lots of research you can find in my webpage as well in, in order to read and understand how the application um, are in terms of increasing the design capacities. So now the other um, innovation uh, that we did in, in, in terms of um, application of these cold foam steel in, in, the, in the portal frame structures, as you get to see that some full scale testing was done using a um, special type of box member, which was a welded member connected um, by two different, two single channel sections. And it was sort of a um, box section which can actually have extra or higher um, twisting resistant or uh, lateral torsional buckling against lateral torsional buckling. These can, um, these can have higher load capacity. So um, we, we, we achieved um, so the three main criteria that, that we, we achieved through design uh, of these members is that uh, bird proof is, is a big problem. So having the single or, or back to back members would not stop this bird proof. Um, therefore, we, we saw that having this um, you know, member with the bird proofing is, is, almost, um, is almost gone. Um, also spanning capability. So you can span a lot with these um, box members because they are not they're really restrained against or, or resistant against twisting or lateral torsional buckling would be very, very uh, less in, in these members. Also, um, as I said, the uh, torsional stiffness would be, would be super high for these members. So we tested this and um, under seismic loading to understand the failure of these frames um, when these box sections were used and we found out the performance is way better and, and can actually span up to 65 meters, which is, which, is, which is really, really great. And some of the projects have been um, using these box members in, in, the, in the actual projects. Um, now coming to the uh, coming to the modular construction, as I said, I touched based on it before that uh, this is sort of a timeless video as you get to see that how these buildings are full form steel buildings, energy efficient, sustainable buildings, which takes almost um, less than even um, you know half the time what you normally spend for installation manufacturing, you know uh, for the whole construction process uh, is 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 really uh, probably the future. So what we realized is from the start time to the finish time of these projects normally. For a one-story, um, you know, uh, uh, modular building uh, and two-story modular building, it's normally about 15 weeks, um, which is, which is um, almost about only four months. So, if within four months, if you could from start to finish, if you could finish those projects, you're saving a lot um, in terms of time, also in terms of energy um, uh, emission. So, some of the research that we've been doing now in terms of roofing members are wind load uh, and cladding. So this um, has been um, a test rig developed by myself and my students. Um, so this is to test it under different cyclic loading conditions. And so we tested um, these roofing profiles under different span. And, you know, we tried to capture, um, you know, the uplift force, which can be caused due to the roofing, uh, due to the wind load. And you can also have cyclic load. We tried to um, use a cyclic damper to simulate the cyclone as well. Um, so some of the testing we did, um, I have a, uh, these results are, are there, as you get to see, these are uh, your uh, different types of graphs coming from three different directions of the wind. So you have the uplift force coming in the Z direction, which is upward. And then you also have in uh, 2D, you have the X and Y uh, forces, which is, which is, um, which is what uh, we, we captured through these tests. And these results were, were captured only in the connections because it's likely that you would have your failure in, in the connection between the roofing profile and the purlin. So we tried to understand the local buckling failure or the dimpling failure in those connections and tried to understand how we can uh, protect or, or, or uh, safeguard those uh, connections from failure. This is a typical testing of, 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 of what I, um, of how these cyclic tests were done. As you see, this is a, um, a typical roofing tray profile, which is normally used very popular in, some of these countries in New Zealand, Australia, in the UK, some of the other countries as well. So these are again 0.4 millimeter thick, 0.55 millimeter thick, 
which is very, very, uh, you know, thin gauge material and can buckle and can dimple quite easily. So as you see that we tried to install different sensors to, to understand where the fa uh, failure may, may, may come. And we, we, uh, we captured all the stress and strain behavior and deflection and other failure um, loads, for example, the, the wind load, which, um, which actually caused the failure, the ultimate failure. So we captured all those information. I'm gonna skip that slide because this will continue until the failure occurred, which has actually in reality has happened after two days. So we had to wait uh, literally for two days to uh, fail these, um, you know, uh, these profiles. And this is how uh, you see when the failure happens. So as I was saying that you can have a dimpling failure, you can have a splitting failure, or you can have different types of cracks as well. Um, so th this is the starting point. So you start with the dimpling, and if you could stop the wind load, uh, which in reality you can't really stop because you don't have any control over stopping the wind load. So what happens is that if it reaches that point where it started dimp dimpling, you would then um, eventually you would then crack and split. Uh, and different types of cracking uh, can happen. You can have a T shape, you can have an O shape, you can have a star crack. So that was a combination of different variables which we studied uh, and more information you can find through, through our publications. And so after we, we, we tested it, we tried, to, uh, we tried to model the same behavior using, um, using the FEA or finite element software, um, which I discussed earlier in my presentation about the design part. So as you get to see that um, this is the stress distribution around the fastener. So these points here are the screws or the self-drilling screws, which goes um, you know, through the roofing profile and, and, and connected with the batten or the purlin, which goes under the roofing. So we could simulate exactly the same behavior as you can see that uh, red um, you know, marks here are, are, are for the maximum stress, which is where you get the failure um, uh, in, the, in the actual test. And this is the typical details of the profile. And when we tried to model the whole um, profile, this is how uh, it, each and every connection you had had those dimpling failures uh, from the wind load, which was captured really well during, um, during the experiment, uh, during the FEA. Now, um, this is the last part where, you know, these cold form steel members are really, really susceptible to fire. So although they are very energy efficient and sustainable, uh, does reduce a lot of construction time, uh, the cost is less, uh, the, 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 the carbon emission, the carbon footprint is less, but in case of fire, you may have different collapse, um, snap through buckling of these members, these members being so um, thin, you can have snap through buckling of your members. So hence why what we did, we did some, testing of, of these, um, of these um, you know, um, uh, fire, uh, of these cold form steel members under, um, under fire. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, this, this um, test video uh, in, 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 um, in, in YouTube. Uh, and so this video, as you see it in YouTube, if you're interested, you can, you can, you can go have a look at the video. So this is, um, this is how it looks like. So we, we actually actually constructed this whole structure, a portal frame using, uh, coal foam steel members and we, we tried to uh, we calculated how much kilojoules of fire load or um, fire um, energy would need to uh, to to reach the failure point and uh, through modeling and through calculations and we uh, from those we calculated how much of um, timber we need um, so we then used a lot of pallets or timber pallets to ignite the fire inside the, the portal frame structure and then we installed a lot of thermocouples inside and so um, to try to capture the temperature at, at, during the, the whole testing. And uh, we could see that the trusses uh, at, the, at the front uh, side of the opening here and then the door, the trusses actually failed and collapsed and the whole building collapsed at about a 650 degrees Celsius, which is um, beyond, and, and it went up to, um, uh, it went up to 43 degree, 43 minutes. Um, and and um, we did uh, use different combinations this te the test results are also published in, in one of the papers that you can find in my webpage as well. If you want full full details of these um, of these tests, um, as you get to see uh, that the, this is the starting point, and, and during the uh, progress of the test, you will see a lot of um, collapse are starting. The collapse started by now, as you get to see that uh, some of the members have started um, started buckling, and you see that uh, this part here, uh, you see this all these uh, frames and, and the trusses are actually falling down. Um, and so this is this is where we 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 realized that the whole structure um, would collapse. So the whole um, stress distribution, everything was captured using uh, different cameras and DIC cameras, and and also using thermocouples, all the fine details that we we could capture 
in terms of failure load, failure temperature, we then develop FEA or finite element program or finite element models to um, simulate this behavior as we observe in the test. And then we try to um, you know, provide guidelines to be how safely we can design and how, what should be the fire rating of these cold form steel members under different applications. Um, coming back to uh, to my slide again, so and then the the wind testing video I sort of showed you before, uh, but again um, there are different type of profiles we tested. For example, not just the tray flat profile that I showed you, but we also tested, you know, kind of um, uh, different other types of profile for corrugate profile, trapezoidal profile, and different other types of profile to get the wind load capacity and how a designer would be designing. So finally, providing design guidelines and. Um, load span tables for those um, different profiles. And that's it. Thanks for um, listening to my presentation. And if you've got any questions or any feedback, I'm happy to, I'm happy to take on um, any questions or feedback.